Alrighty. Um, I have to remember where we were. Last week, we're, we're studying Romans. We're in chapter... Are we in chapter 6? We're in chapter 6, are we not? We're dealing with... Um, yes, we're, we're dealing with the first of the objections that is commonly brought up. Um, and we're dealing in a section of dealing with baptism. Okay, that needs to be turned off. I don't even know what that was. Notifications or something. You know what? I forgot to put this in forgot to put this in airplane mode. Wendy's not in the room, see, and I'm just <laughs> just a train wreck. Okay. We're dealing with baptism, and, and when we left off, we were talking about a number of churches that, that look to baptism as a means of salvation, eternal salvation to get to heaven. There are a lot of churches that believe that. Um, and so we're refuting that argument as we're going through and trying to answer the objection. So in this section that we're dealing with right now, this objection that if God does all the work, and, and, and so it doesn't matter what we do, so therefore we can just live any old way we want to. That's the objection. And Paul's refuting the argument by showing that in the new birth, the Holy Spirit, and this is things that we've already covered, that the Holy Spirit places within the regenerate person a hunger and a desire to live righteously and to seek and to come into conformity with the law of God. Um, hence a desire to just continue to live in sin is an evidence that such a person doesn't have the regenerate nature anyway. That's a natural nature. The regenerate person is the one that starts looking, looking for God, seeking God. It's like I've made this point, I don't know how many times you find somebody that's, that, that wanders into a church and gets saved. Well, why were they in the church? Why did they go to the church to begin with? Well, the reason they went to the church to begin with was they were already saved. And it was the Holy Spirit telling them, you need to go in that church. And so they walked in through the door. It wasn't their action of coming down to the aisle that eternally saved them. They were saved before they walked in the door of the place to start with in, in most cases. The desire to seek God comes from the new birth. Without the new birth, you have no desire to seek God. And that's just the way that natural man is. Also, it is stuck in the mind, in the natural mind of fallen man that he has to do something in order to get saved. That is a natural tendency that if it comes to any type of religion, there has to be some sort of work for me to do. That is stuck in the mind of human beings. Once you're regenerated, you're given the ability to see that that's not how it works. But until that time, you're going to hold on to that until the day you die. That is stuck within the mind of natural man. You follow that? That's why everybody wonders what they have to do. The Philippian jailer, what must I do? People are always wondering what they need to do until they're shown that there's nothing you can do. It's already been done for you. And it's only the regenerate that can then glory in that and say, thank God. The natural, the unregenerate, is still going to fight for the idea that there's got to be something that I have to do. And that's just, that's just the way it is. That's the way human nature is. Now, we, last week we looked at verses 1 uh, through 3. We covered those. And we are now at verses 4 and 5. Um, where it says, therefore, we are buried with him, that's Christ, by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we, should, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness 
of his resurrection. Now a couple of things I want to point out here. Like as, that term like as, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised, like as, that comes from a Greek that means just as or like something in comparison. So, which is just exactly what it sounds like it means, isn't it? That's what, if you just read the English, that's what it means. Like, like, a, it's like something else. Okay, it's, it's a, this is symbolic, folks. Your bab, the baptism is a symbol. It is like something else. It is symbolic in nature. It's not what makes you a child of God. It's symbolic. Okay? And the word even so means thus in this way. So like as Christ was raised from the dead, even so we also should walk in newness of life. All right? Baptism represents the death, the burial, and the resurrection. So when you go under the water, you're being buried. When you're raised, you're being raised in newness of life. You should walk in newness of life because it represents that resurrection. It, it's not an actual resurrection. You're no different when you come up out of the water than you were when you went down into the water. But now you've taken the step of obedience and it, you should walk in newness of life. Okay? But it doesn't make you new. It's symbolic. It's strictly symbolic. Um, in verse 5, it says, For if we have been planted together, planted together, in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 4 says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism. Buried, planted. Let me give you a couple of examples. Wendy's out of town. We've got a couple of flower beds that, that were in little ones back by the carport that were in really bad shape, full of weeds, haven't been taken care of. So I thought it's a nice thing, a nice gesture. I'll go clean those up and I'll fix them so that when she gets home there's something better than when she left. Okay, thanks for the rain, but it's okay, I got them done in time. Um, so I go to Lowe's and I buy some plants and I bring them home, okay? And now I have to plant the plants, right? So I take them out of their little thing, that little plastic deal, and I threw them in the flower bed and went in the house. Does that count? Is that planting? No, to plant, you gotta dig a hole, don't you? You have to dig a hole and you have to take the part that needs to be planted and you have to stick it in the ground and then you have to cover it up with dirt. It's kind of like seeds. Now I understand that if you're going to overseed your, your lawn you can just cast the seed out there. But if you want to grow, if you want to grow some sort of crop, you can't just sprinkle the seeds on the top of the dirt and expect them to become anything other than food for the birds. Right? You have to dig a hole and stick the seeds in the hole and cover them up. We are planted and yet how many churches sprinkle and call that baptism? How many churches pour water on the top of a baby's head and call that baptism? The fact that Paul says that we are buried and that we are planted argues for immersion. That's what baptism is. And if you've been, if they call it baptism and do anything other than bury you in the water, it ain't baptism, folks. Now, I understand that it could be expeditious, that if all I had to do was sprinkle, I could sprinkle this whole church and you wouldn't even have to get, you wouldn't have to get out of your seat. I could just walk around and flick water in your face and we'll call that sprinkling. But let me, how many years do you suppose an undertaker would get if they came by to see a shop and there were thousands and thousands of dead bodies laying out in the 40 acres behind his shop 
just laying there in various states of decomposition with a little bit of dirt sprinkled on their forehead. That ain't burying, folks. To be buried means you're under whatever the medium is, and in this case it's water. Okay? Nothing else works, and Paul's pretty consistent on that. And then he says that we should walk in newness of life. I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to talk about another like figure. Okay? We just talked about just talked about like as. So we're going to look at another like as. In 1 Peter chapter 3, as we talk about Noah. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. Well, let's go back a little bit. Look at verse uh, Look at verse 20, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. Now let me ask you a question. What kind of salvation do you think that was? Was that eternal salvation or was that temporal salvation? What were they saved from? They were saved from drowning in the flood. Right? That's, this is temporal salvation we're talking about. We're not, that's not, does not mean, that's not how they got to heaven. They did not get to heaven because they walked in the ark and God closed the door. They were already going to heaven. God had been talking to Noah for a hundred and something years about building the ark. He was already a righteous man and had been for a long time. There, that salvation in the ark was temporal, okay? Not eternal. Now look at verse 21. The like figure where unto even baptism doth also now save us. You see, baptism saves us the same way the ark did, temporally. And look at the next statement. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the answer of a good conscience. So, now whatever salvation came from Noah and his family, the same exact salvation comes through baptism. It's a like figure. It's representative of that. Well, clearly it was temporal salvation. And if it's the answer of a good conscience, then the conscience is good. It doesn't get good by coming up out of the water. It's the answer of a good conscience. The people that are baptized are already representing that they're born again. That's why they make a profession of faith before the church. That's the reason for that. That's why it's called believer's baptism. Um, and also, since baptism is for believers, look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 30, 36 through 39. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. All right, now we're going to get into that heavily here in just a minute but notice it's the belief he believed with all his heart that Jesus is the Son of God and he commanded the chariot to stand still and they went down both into the water both Philip and the eunuch and he baptized him why do you have why do they both have to go down into the water if all he had to do was sprinkle some water in his face couldn't he just taken a bottle of water and poured it over his head no, they both went down into the water so that he could dunk him in the water. That's what baptism is. And it required belief. Now, if it requires belief, if that's the requirement, look at 1 John 5, 1. Most of you probably don't even need to turn to it. 1 John 5, 1. 
Whosoever, universal statement, believe, believeth, that's present tense, believes, whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That's perfect tense. Perfect tense comes before present tense. It's a past completed action. You have to be born again before you have the ability to believe. Therefore, if you believe, you're already born again. So how would baptism make you born again if you have to be born again before you believe so you can get baptized? You see? Look also at uh, John chapter 6 and verse 47. John chapter 6 and verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Now let's get rid of the, of the old English. Whoso, or he that believes on me has everlasting life. You already have it by the time you believe on him. You don't get it. You have it. If you're a believer, you have it. Now, I threatened to go over this last week and I ran out of time. So I'll go over it now. What is it that you have to believe? There's a lot of people that can make the statement that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Mormons can make that statement. Now they actually believe that he's the, the, the brother of, of the devil, right? But he's the Son of God and so are all the rest of us. So they can make the statement that they believe he's the Son of God. A, a Jehovah's Witness can make that statement. Are we going to baptize one of them with all the rest of their screwy doctrine that they've got? Arminian Baptists can walk in here and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There's a lot of devils believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We're not going to baptize them, I hope. So what exactly does it mean to say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? We know that there are multiple Christs out there. We read about them over in Galatians. And I did a sermon a long time ago called Which Jesus? In which we looked at a whole bunch of different Jesuses that are out there. Because there's a bunch of them out there. How do we know which one you have to believe in before we're ready to stick you in the water and dunk you? Which one? What are some of the identifying marks? Um, and I've struggled with this because, I've, uh, because I've, I fear that maybe I've put some people in the water and maybe I shouldn't have put them in the water to start with. Maybe I didn't vet them as thoroughly as I should, um, should have. So if that's my fault, I'll suffer for it. It's not your problem. When I bring someone forward, it means that I've vetted them and I've gone through everything I need to go through to where I'm at least satisfied that they should be there. Um, now this doesn't apply to anybody here because everybody here has already been baptized, but for those of you coming, <laughs> for any, any newbies, the, the, the qualifications are a little bit, a little tighter. Because I'm tired of putting people in the water only to find out that they believed in the eternal sonship doctrine. I'm tired of putting people, just and, and then out, out the door they go six months later. Enough of that. I want to make sure that people actually belong in the church. That way maybe they'll still be here when I turn this church over to somebody else in another 25 or 30 years. <laughs> if I live to be 100. <laughs> anyway, you get the point, right? I don't, want a, I don't want this revolving door thing that we keep that we keep seeing because it because it it affects everybody. So a couple of things that I that and, and I have I have this printed out. Anybody wants one, I've got copies in my briefcase. Um, it's on the website. You can go to the website and there's a section there called qualifications for baptism. And so this is it. Okay? The things you have to believe. What that little statement means. And remember when the Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he was speaking in the first century. Eternal sonship doctrine hadn't come around yet. There was a whole bunch of false doctrine that has crept into the church that wasn't in existence at the time that he said that he believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. We have to figure out what the doctrine was at the time that he said that. And then 
you'll know what it is that he believed, right? So we've got to wind this doctrine back down to what it originally was, and that's the Jesus you have to believe in. Now there are some characteristics of him, okay? Um, first off, you have to believe that, that, that that man, Jesus of Nazareth, that particular man was a historical fi figure from the first century, that he existed, that he really did exist. That he wasn't some phantom. Believe it or not, there are churches that will let you into their membership if you believe that he was a phantom and never really existed. You have to believe that he existed, that he was real, that he was human, um, that he was in fact born of a virgin, that that actually happened, that he lived a sinless life, that he was the promised Messiah, which is Hebrew for Greek is Christ, the, the term Christ is a, a, a translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, so they're, they're interconnected. Jesus Christ, that's not his name, that's his title. Um, and it means the same as Messiah, and they both mean anointed. Jesus was the anointed one, okay? That he's the one that came into the world to eternally save all of God's elect, and then he did so by paying the price for their sins on the cross. Further, that he was both human and divine. That he had two natures within him, human and divine. And, it, and at the incarnation, when the power of the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, and within her was conceived this baby Jesus, at that exact moment, the divine nature was fused with that I don't know, what do you call an egg when it first splits? Where's my medical people here? Well, not an embryo, right? It's, I mean, it, whatever you call it, at the moment that of conception, those two natures are fused together to remain together forever. That divine nature is just as much a part of Jesus as his human nature is. They were fused together at the incarnation that's when Jesus, that's the Son of God. That being that came out of, the, uh, out of the Virgin Mary, that was both divine and human, that's the Son of God. So when you say that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that's the one you're pointing to. You're not pointing to some mysterious, begotten God back in eternity somewhere, like the Roman Catholics and the primitive Baptists and a whole bunch of other people teach. You're not looking at that guy. Anybody can believe in that guy because anybody can believe a lie. It takes grace to believe truth. So if you have the ability to believe that, that Christ became the Son of God at the Incarnation, that argues that you're born again. Because only born again people can believe that. You notice how few, how many fewer, how fewer and fewer and rarer and rarer that gets? The farther away we get from Adam, the fewer churches there are that actually teach incarnational sonship. It's going the way of the dodo bird, but that's the evidence that you're a child of God, not believing in some mysterious, nonsensical thing. <clears throat> you also have to believe that that Christ completed his mission. That he was sent here to save his elect children and he did it. That he didn't just make part of the down payment, now it's up for everybody else to do their part. No, that he finished what he came down here to do. That he went home victorious. And you gotta believe that someday he's gonna return. And there's a few other I don't want to go through the whole thing here, but that's, that's, the, that's the crux of it. That's the basis of it. That's what it means when the Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the belief that makes you a candidate for baptism. And if your belief isn't that, then you're really not a candidate for baptism. Not here, anyway. Maybe at the first missionary Baptist church down the road, but not here. Okay, because that's the, that's the Christ that we teach and, and always has been within the churches that we fellowship with. Okay. Um, now, let's get back to our passage. There are 
I've heard of these people. I've, I haven't run into one in person, but I've heard of them. Elder Gerald used to talk about people that would that would look at this passage, and it's undeniable what it says, isn't it? Isn't it pretty plain that when you say, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life, for if we have been planted together with the likeness of his death, we shall also uh, in the likeness of his res we shall be also in the likeness of isn't that kind of plain and yet you got people out here that still want to sprinkle and they still want to pour well, how do you get around planted how do you get around buried what kind of argument do you come up with to try to refute that position and one of the things they'll say is well this is this is spirit baptism they will say I don't see water in the verse there's no water in that verse. I don't see water mentioned in that verse. This isn't talking about water baptism. It's talking about spirit baptism. Now the problem is that when you try to advance an error, you usually end up trying to prove too much. Because I can very easily come right back and say, well, I see water in the verse everywhere where it says the word baptism. I see water in every one of those. And not only that, I don't see spirit in the verse. Show me spirit in the verse, because it's not in there either. So you can't very well argue that this isn't water, it's spirit, if spirit ain't there either. Okay? When you look up the word baptize in all its various forms in the Bible, go get a concordance, look it up if you got a couple of days to kill with nothing else to do, and go look up every one of those occurrences and lay them out on flash, on three by five cards the way we used to do it in the old days and put them in piles according to what according to what they represent you will find that in over a hundred and twenty two places it's referring to people that are being dunked in water and in a whole bunch of other chunks of places it's referring to a guy by the name of John who used to dunk people in the water. And then there's a few places where it's used metaphorically, always in reference to people being dunked in the water. Baptism is being dunked in the water. That's what the Bible teaches, just by comparing the uses of the words. Um, let's go another step further. The Greek word translated baptism means to dip or immerse. That's the primary meaning of the word. It comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to put or go under water, hence immerse. That's what baptizo means. So when you look up the word, John the Baptist was a guy that immersed people. That's what baptism is. That's what, it's what it means. That's what the Greek word means. To go under water, hence to immerse. Okay? Now, there are people that like to use the, use the idea that, well, you can sprinkle. Sprinkle is the same thing as baptism. You've heard that argument, right? If you're Roman Catholic, well, they pour. Okay, I think Catholics pour. Some people sprinkle, right? Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 18 through 21. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Anybody in this room think that that word sprinkled is translated from the word baptizo? What do you think? If baptism, if you can sprinkle and it's baptism, then wouldn't the word sprinkle in the text come from baptism? Wouldn't they be the, it's not that word though. 
Amazingly enough, it's not that word. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and baptism of the blood of Jesus Christ. Is that what your text says? No, sprinkling. Now, what word is translated sprinkle here? Baptism? Is it the word we get baptism from? No, it's haridzo, which means to sprinkle. You see, the Greeks have a word for dipping, and they have a word for sprinkling, too. And they have a word for pour. Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit. How about that? There's the word pour. Not translated from baptizo, it's translated from ekano. So the Greeks have a word for baptize, which means to immerse. And they have a word for sprinkle, which is usually translated sprinkle, and they have a word for pouring. So why would you, why would you mix it up? Other than the fact that you don't care, and it's just simpler. We can change the rules, right? We'll just change the rules. It's probably easier to pour water on the forehead of a little baby than it is to take the little baby and stick him down underneath the water. They're probably not going to like that a whole lot. You take a newborn baby and stick it, they probably think you're going to drown them. Or their parents do. So we'll just pour. That's okay. Because really, in reality, these, they don't care what God said. They couldn't care less what God said. We can get more people in the church by sprinkling and pouring than we can by requiring them to go step down into the water and get dunked underneath the water. And if we make them all stand up and say they believe something, well, we're not gonna get as many people in the church and hence this business model says we need more people in the church in order to be profitable. That's why most churches do what they do. They're a business, they're not a church. And businesses need to make money. And the bigger market share they get, the more money they make. And then the Pope can wear Prada. Right? Okay. Now the English word, the origin of our English word baptize is Middle English, Middle English via the Old French from Ecclesiastical Latin which comes from the Greek, which means to immerse. There's no way around this, folks. Now, let me ask you a question. When you put someone down under the water, doesn't that kind of look like you're burying them? You're completely covering them up. Kind of looks like that. And when they come up, come back up out of the water, doesn't it kind of look like a resurrection? You can't do that with sprinkling, can you? How do you, how do you symbolize resurrection with sprinkling or pouring? You can't. But when you put someone down under the water, now they're buried, now they're planted, and then when you bring them back up, now they're resurrected, and as a result, they should walk in newness of life. At that point, they should continue to be obedient and grow as they move forward. That's the symbolism that we have. Now, I realize I'm going on and on and on and on and on and on and on about something that's obvious to most of the people in the room. But entire religions have been formed off of taking this and twisting it around. It's that important of a point. 
it, it's really that serious and that important of a point and it shouldn't be considered a, a, as minor. Then you have another, there's, here's another stupid argument. This one I have heard. Where people will say, well, Jesus wasn't really buried in the ground anyway. He was laid in a tomb. And so he wasn't buried in the dirt. He was put in a tomb. And then a rock was rolled over the top of it. So he was never buried to begin with. So how can you, why are you using this type of terminology? Because he wasn't buried in the dirt. Well, I, I argue that, um, you know, once you, whether it's a cave or a tomb, once you cross the threshold, you're under dirt. You're in the earth at that point. When you've got ground, if you go through a tunnel, go through a tunnel in your car that's carved through the middle of a, a, of a mountain, you're under that mountain when you go th into that tunnel, right? Uh, you want proof? Let, let the tunnel collapse and tell me how much dirt you're under. Try to dig your way out. Once you go into that tomb, you are in the ground. Same as being buried. Now, on planet Earth, we have, there are only two types of rocks. General, I mean there's different kinds of stones, but there's really only two two ways that rock is formed. One is igneous rock, which is laid, by, laid down by a lava flow, and then it cools and hardens and becomes a rock. That's one type. The other is sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock is dirt that's laid down by water, and then over a period of time, the water evaporates and it becomes hard and turns into a rock. So, a tomb cut into rock is just cut into hard dirt. It's just hard dirt. It's still dirt, it's hard to take a rock and beat on it with a sledgehammer long enough and you'll find out that it's really only made out of dirt and it's gotten hard over the years. I, we, have a, we have a section in our driveway where the, where the um, I think we need gutters or something, where water from the rain cuts down, hits a flower bed, and washes, washes dirt down into the driveway, okay? And if I'm not diligent to clean that up within a couple of weeks, you gotta go out there and start beating it up because it'll solidify and become a rock. If you're not careful, it'll turn into a rock. Um, that's all a tomb is. So when they laid Christ in the tomb, he was surrounded by dirt, was he not? albeit hard dirt, and when they rolled a rock stone, a hard dirt hard stone over the opening of that thing, he was completely immersed in dirt. But that's just another one of those silly arguments that treat, people try to make because they don't want to follow what God said. They want it to do it their own way. So they'll come up with that argument. Now, there are two, two conclusions that we can reach from, from these two verses. And first, that baptism is by immerse, immersion and nothing else counts. Um, when you look at the, at the simile in verses 4 and 5, buried like as, planted together in the likeness, clearly baptism is by immersion. And it's a representation or a likeness. It's not a literal object. It's symbolic. It does not place you into Christ. It places you into Christ's doctrine, but it does not place you into Christ's nature. You were there before you ever got to the edge of the baptistry, or you shouldn't have been at the edge of the baptistry to begin with. Okay, now something else it symbolizes, and that is a vital union with Christ. Look at verses 6 and 7. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Okay? The phrase, our old man, in here where it says, um, where am I, verse 6, that our old man is crucified with him, 
That old man emphasizes the habits of our old unconverted life. That's the lifestyle of an unregenerate person. That's, that's our old man. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22 where Paul says that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts you see the old lifestyle that old unregenerate lifestyle that's the old man that's what you're what we're commanded to put off now in the inward man that's already been changed in the new birth but in the flesh nature that you walk around with it's still just as rotten as it ever was and so the commandment is quit doing the things that you used to do that used to be okay that aren't okay now because you're at war with yourself put off the old man that's the thing that was that was killed let's go back and look at the verse knowing this that our old man is crucified with him now let me say this and then maybe I can tie it back together again if you are born again you are given an ability to live righteously you may not do it all the time but you have the ability to do it your old man has been crucified that old unregenerate nature is dead within you but if you want to head that direction you can you follow me you don't have to sin you will but you don't have to you have the ability to live righteously even though you don't unfortunately we don't usually take advantage of all that God has to offer you can get through life he does there are ways of getting through it and as far as legally is concerned when you sin if you take advantage of the provision that God has made within the time frame allotted and you get down on your knees and ask for forgiveness and forsake the sin it's as if you never sinned anyway God forgives you and you move on now if you don't do that eventually he's gonna have to remind you and that's where the chastisement comes in but you have the ability to live righteous in this world because the old man was crucified with Christ okay let's look at another passage look at um, look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 9 lie not one to another seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him now within you you have these two natures you have you have the new man the inward man the spirit and the soul which are new you have the flesh which is still corrupt if you follow the flesh well then you're going to be just like any other unregenerate person because your flesh is still unregenerate if you follow the spirit then you can control the flesh if you just let go of the reins and let the flesh do what the flesh wants to do well then you just go out and live just like everybody else does it's what Paul's telling you is grab a hold of the reins with the spiritual side of you that has been changed that has the ability to control the flesh as long as you hang on hang tight to the reins and you're let follow the spirit don't follow the flesh does that make sense and that's that's kind of what we're dealing with here so when we look at the when we look at this idea about the old man let me get back to the passage that the old man being crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed the body of sin we'll get to that in a minute um, let's look at this idea of being crucified with him okay 
Turn to Isaiah chapter 53. This refers to the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Isaiah chapter 53. Verses 4 through 6. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. When Jesus Christ was nailed to that cross for those six hours, he had all, he suffered the punishment, the eternal punishment for every sin that you committed. Your old man was nailed to that cross with him. And every sin that you ever committed in the past, that you will commit today, that you will commit to commit in the future, was laid on Jesus Christ and he paid the price for it. That's the substitutionary atonement. Now, had he just been human, he probably would have vaporized on the spot. But since he was God, he was able to withstand it. But you know what, there was one thing that's kind of interesting, and that is that during the crucifixion there was a point at which he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was the one time that the divine, even the divine nature within him turned its back on him. And he couldn't feel it anymore. You see, that divine nature had always been with him, and he always knew it was there. He could feel it. It was different. It's kind of like, kind of like a child of God feels different. When you first come to an understanding of this, and all of a sudden things that you used to do, they just don't seem right anymore. Used to be fun. It's not fun anymore. I used to like doing this, and now I feel like I need to study my Bible. You can tell there's something there. Well, Christ could tell that he was different. And, and all through his life, the Bible says he was tempted just the same way we are, except he had a divine nature to pull him back and keep him, not allow him to sin. Well, now, for the first time on the cross, since God is a purer eyes than to even look upon sin, he, had, he turned his back on him. And so for that period of time, not only was Christ suffering the physical, the physical pain and anguish of, of the most brutal form of capital punishment that was ever conceived by man, but he was also paying the price for all of the sins of all of the elect, and he was doing it all by himself because the divine nature had turned his back on him. That's the substitutionary atonement. He did that for us. He did it for you. He didn't do it for himself. He didn't need to do it for himself. He did it for you. And so that's what's meant when, the, when we're talking about your old man being crucified with him. All of the sins that you've ever committed or ever will commit, he paid the price for on the cross. So you say, well, then why do, I, why do I sometimes get punished in this life? Because you don't, follow, you don't follow what God says and you don't repent of the sin when you do commit it. He elected us from the very beginning that we should be holy and without blame before him in love over in Ephesians. Remember? That's the reason he chose us, that we should be holy. Folks, you ought to be holy. You should be holy and without blame. Walk in newness of life. Start acting like you are what you are and that's what that's what Paul is trying to stress in this section and we're going to see it over and over and over where Paul is telling these Romans and hence you if you're a child of God if you're a believer then you are a child of God so start acting like one start living like one because you should be holy and you should walk in newness of life. And that's the crux of what we're, what we're dealing with in this passage. Um, look at um, uh, 
Now we get down to the second one. I've got to get back, here, back to my verse here. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin, the body of sin is the very principle itself, the principle of sin that, that Christ destroyed um, on the cross. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Look also at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, that body of sin was destroyed by Christ on the cross. That's one of the things he did. And therefore, giving you, your inward man, the ability to live in this life in righteousness and in fellowship with God. Now, we don't do it perfectly. And when we let our flesh run amok, we're going to get ourselves into trouble. We always do. But that doesn't mean we have to. We're not bound to. You don't have to sin. If you sin, it's because you do it. But you don't have to. There are people in this world that don't really have an option. They don't have the inward man to control the outward man. And so they just go about life because that's all they've got. They, they, have, they don't have that new birth. They don't have a new spirit. They don't have a new heart. They've still got the old stony heart that any lost person has. So they don't have the same ability to try to control actions that you do. But if you're born again, you have that on the inside. Now start controlling the outside with what you've got on the inside. Okay? In verses 8 through 11, I think we've got time to get into here some. We're told that we should reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to Jesus Christ. Again, we're continuing on with the same, with the same theme, theme. And remember, this is because of an objection where people will say, well, if the law doesn't save me, then I can, I mean, if, if I'm going to be saved anyway, I can just live any way that I want to. And Paul is going over and over and over again, compounding the fact that no, you're not to live any way that you want to. You're to live according to God because you have the ability to do it now. Since you can do it, start doing it. Okay? Verses 8 through 11. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That word reckon. Well, first, notice Christ being resurrected is he's freed from the sin burden that was imputed to him. So we see him dying to sin once, but he was also resurrected, triumphing over sin and destroying it and establishing righteousness and coming back to life. You see, his dying on the cross, you go into a Catholic church, you notice all you ever see are pictures of him hanging on a cross? That's only part of the story. The fact that he died on the cross, if that's it, if that's the end of the story, it doesn't mean much. He had to be resurrected. You don't see much in a Catholic church about the resurrection. Maybe on Easter Sunday, but the rest of the time, they're praying to a dead, cross, dead Christ hanging on a cross. They're not looking at the resurrected Christ, the one that actually saved you. Now, Paul begins this argument 
that just as Christ killed sin by taking the sin debt of the elect upon himself and paying the price for it and is now alive again, it's the same way with us. Just as we died with him, we also live with him. Okay? Our, our old man died with him. He killed the principle of sin in us by his death and he's put a principle of righteousness in us which causes us to desire the things of God and, and not the things of the world. That's where that comes from and it comes as a result of his dying on the cross and being raised from the dead. Without that, you wouldn't have any principle within you any, other, any different than anybody else. It was the price that was paid by him that allowed God to justly cause all of his elect to be reborn or born anew okay now there's two things to consider relative to this first because Christ took our former sins with him to the cross and paid the price for him on the cross we are legally freed from those sins okay he paid the price legally on the so there's no more legal judgment relative to those sins. Now let me ask you a question. If Christ died for the entire human race and legally paid the price for the sins of the entire human race, is God just to require a big chunk of them to pay the price themselves? No. That would be like that would be like somebody owing me money and paying me off and then I go to somebody else and say well you need to pay me off even though even though he paid your debt Chad owes me money Dusty comes along and pays the price off and I still go after Chad that's not just if Christ died for the entire human race and paid the price for all of their sins it's not just for God to then punish a big chunk of them because the price was already paid when Christ paid the price for the sins of the elect he paid it in full you are legally freed from those sins legally okay our old man that sinful nature was crucified with him and our sinful nature died on the cross with him that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of God even the we also should walk in newness of life so he's trying to make the picture here that, look, Christ died to all of this stuff, and your old man died with him. So don't live like the old man anymore. Because you don't have to. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, Christ paid the price. And in the new birth, by God's grace, we're given the ability to live a life of righteousness which we couldn't live before we were born again. When you're born again, you, you now have that ability. You have the ability to do it. Doesn't mean you will, but you do have the ability. And you should do it. You should walk in newness of life. You should be holy and without blame before him in love. You have, you've been given the ability to do it. Um, so he's not only has he made us legally freed from sin, but he's made us potentially freed from sin, giving us the ability to live righteously. The bad news in all of this is that the longer that you're in this, the longer that you try the worse you look. Because there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that I never even knew was sinful. And then you find out, oh, I can't do that either. I thought that was okay. Yeah, no, I hadn't read that verse yet. So the more experience you have trying to live godly, the more sinful you look. That's just the nature of it. And that's what, we'll, 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 when we get into the, a little bit later verses, we'll see Paul lamenting the very same thing. There's, I, I try to do good and I end up doing evil. 
The things that I thought were okay aren't okay. How am I ever going to get rid of this? Well, the only way we ever get rid of this is eventually we die and someday we will be resurrected and then our new inward man will be joined with a new outward man and will and then we'll be completely holy and 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 just before God. But until then, it's a battle that we're going to fight forever and Paul's trying to tell the point, he's setting up the stage now for later chapters on why we should strive to be holy and not take this idea that, well, if I'm saved, I'm saved, so I can just go do whatever I want to do, okay? Um, now, understand something. I am not advocating some second work of grace like the Pentecostals teach, that, that once you have this, you'll never sin again. I'm not advocating that at all. I'm advocating that you have the ability in regeneration not to sin. You don't have to sin. But I know that you do. And the reason I know you do is because I do. And I'm no different than the rest of you. Um, now, sometimes because of our own stubbornness, our own hard-headedness, we refuse to follow what we know we ought to. And we get ourselves into get ourselves into things and if we don't repent in time God will remind us that we got a thick skull and and sometimes that hurts more than others for for those of us that have got really thick skulls when when he when it's time for a whipping he comes at you with a razor strap rather than just a belt you know but as long as you repent in time if you use that time to, to deal with sin properly, then it's gone. It's already been paid for. He can forgive you because it's already been paid for. But if you commit it in this life, after he's gone through all the trouble of regenerating you, and you continue to live ungodly, you're going to find out about it if you're a child of God. And if you skate through this life, live in any way that you want to, if you're like, if you're one of those people that says, well, if I'm saved, I can live any way I want to, and you do that, and you and you get through life with a smile on your face, look out. We're all going to pay for our sins, folks. And we're either going to pay for them here, or we're going to pay for them in the next life. And you better hope that you pay for them here. One way of paying for them is acknowledging that you committed them and getting down on your knees and asking God to forgive you. That's one way of paying for your sins in this life. When you commit them, admit them, ask for forgiveness, trust that God's forgiven you, and try to do better the next time. You say, well, how is that a payment? You know what? The pride in man, sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes it's hard to get down on your knees and admit that you screwed up. That's one of the hardest things for a prideful human being to do is to admit that they were wrong, to admit that they made a mistake, to be humble and ask for forgiveness. That's hard to do. That's a tough one. And it's even tough to do it before a God that you don't even have to look him in the eyes. But it's still tough. But do it. Because that's the payment to get yourself out from underneath the wrath of God if you find yourself falling into sin. So, why do we sin? Because we don't avail ourselves of the provisions. And sometimes because of our own weakness in that unregenerate part of our nature, we just we just don't do what we ought to do. We don't avail ourselves of the provisions that God have made, has made for us. But it doesn't mean we have to. As far as sin, we don't have to. We can live pretty much without it. Okay? Now, verse 11. Do I have time to get into this? I think I can do this one pretty let me let me go ahead and finish this up I know it, it will go a little over an hour but that's okay um, 
Wendy's not here, so you can stretch it a little bit. Um, she's not looking at me like I'm hungry, so God, I hope she doesn't have Dave cut this part out. <laughs> um, Verse 11, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That word reckon right there, we spent quite a bit of time over in chapter 4 dealing with the word reckon. You remember that? I don't want to rehash all of that, but the word reckon here is exactly the same word that's translated as reckon, counted, and imputed over in chapter 4. It's the same thing. It means to count something as if it had originated where found when actually it had been put there by something one or something else. In other words, counted as if it had done, if we had done it when in fact someone else did it for us. Reckoning yourself to be dead unto sins is arguing that someone else made you dead unto sins. You are, reckon, you are to reckon yourself that way. And you are to consider that I am dead to sins. Again, you don't have to get involved in them. If you do get involved in them, it's your fault for going there. In Romans chapter 4, in verse 3, we have the word counted. Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. In verse 4, we have the word reckoned. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And in verse 6, we have the verse imputed, even as David also describeth the, blessed of the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. And they all come from the same Greek word, and it's the same Greek word that we find over here that says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. So, you count yourselves indeed unto sin. Impute yourselves indeed unto sin. Consider yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Consider yourself dead to it. If you're dead to something, you don't get involved in it. And then as you start to discover that something else goes into the list of something that God doesn't want you to do because it's sinful, then count yourself dead to that and don't do it. And when you do, when you slip up, when temptation gets to you, then get down on your knees and apologize for it. And ask God to help you better the next, or more the next time. Not better, but more. If you tie this together with verse 6, where it says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that's a fact. The old man is crucified with him, and in verse 11 he's saying, Act like it. Reckon yourselves dead to sin. Accept the fact that that's the way things actually are that you're saved by the grace of God, and start living like it. Get on with it. Start living like you are what you actually are. That's the argument that Paul's making here. Which means that he's arguing against this idea that we can live any way we want to. Nowhere in here is he saying that you can get away with living any way you want to. He's saying exactly the opposite, that if God saved you, then start acting like a saved person and live like a saved person rather than just living like some old unregenerate fool out there. You know, this all goes back to, this all goes back to the word believe. 
talk about believing. The word believe is a compound word that comes from be, which means to exist, and the old Norse word leave, which means to live. Believe means to be live. So if you believe, then live it. Believe it. Live like you believe. Now that's a pretty good place to stop. So I'm going to call it quits for this morning. I thank you for your kind and patient attention. Next week we'll pick back up here um, and get back into this, into the fact that we have this vital union with Christ. And I'm, I'm assuming that next week we'll finish, we'll finish with with, um, with the first, this first objection, and then we'll get into the first part of the second objection and continue on with our study. Thank you again. Let's stand and, and be dismissed in prayer.